Joshua chapter 23. Uh, by the grace of God, I shall read. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years. And you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off, from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and drive them out of your sight and you shall possess their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. Therefore, be very strong to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right hand nor to the left, that you may not mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of the names of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man has been able to stand before you to this day. One man of you puts to a flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Verse 11. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. For if you turn back and cling to the remnant of these nations remaining among you and make marriages with them so that you associate with them and they with you, know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you, but they shall be a snare and a trap for you, a whip on your sides and thorns in your eyes until you perish from off this good ground that the Lord your God has given you. And now, I am about to go the way of all the earth. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that no one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. Verse 15. But just as all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you have been fulfilled for you, so the Lord will bring upon you all the evil things until he has destroyed you from off this good land that the Lord your God has given you. If you transgress the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow to them, then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land that he has given to you. And this is the word of the Lord. Uh, thank you so much, um, Deacon SP, for that very helpful reading of God's Word. Uh, in Joshua chapter 23, I can ask you to please keep your Bibles open on that passage. And although I am doing a summary of the whole book, um, that chapter essentially covers all the big themes or all the big ideas that we would find in the book of Joshua. And so I'll ask you to please keep it open. Uh, in a short while, we are going to come back to it. For those who are joining us online, perhaps for the first time, for your benefit, my name is Harrison, and I am one of the elders in this church. Um, and the Lord Jesus Christ is my Savior. I rejoice in the fact that uh, he has known me by name and that he has called me his own. And he has promised me eternal life. And so day by day I cling to him and rely on his saving grace alone. For I know indeed his word can be trusted. Let us pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of technology. And we thank you that um, we can meet, we can share 
we can have conversation, we can even hear your word taught freely uh, through the airwaves, through technology, through the internet. And we thank you for an opportunity to still be able to fellowship with these dear ones, wherever we are. We thank you that we can still open the scriptures, we can worship, we can sing, we can have the Bible read to us. And for these things, Lord, we choose to be grateful. And this morning, Lord, as we come to your word, we pray, would you please open our hearts? Would you bring to memory the things that we need to bear, the things that we need to remember, as you have said to your people many times? Please, Lord, bring us to that place of hearing and remembering and obeying. So come and be my helper and help all those who are listening to me, young and old, so that, Lord, we are all helped to love you and to serve you. In the name of Jesus, your recent son from the dead. Amen. We have been on a journey for the last about, uh, well, nearly three months actually, uh, for the whole of February and March, and now um, um, part of April. We've been thinking through these words that are written to us in the book of Joshua. It's been exciting, particularly today, because it has been said over and over through the songs, through the opening psalm, through, the, um, uh, uh, through even the comments that the service leader was making, the big theme of the book seems to have come through quite clearly to most of us, that the Lord is faithful. So I need not to perhaps belabor that point too much, because that seems to be the clarion call. The Lord is faithful. And on what good words to listen at a time when we are facing the frustration of coronavirus, COVID-19. What a time to be reminded of the Lord's faithfulness. And what an appropriate book to have been studying as a church family together to remember the Lord is faithful. The Lord is a good God who actually keeps his word. So for those of us who are perhaps watching this from home, and even for the young ones, if you are asked what is the message of Joshua, your answer ought to be um, quite simple and clear and straightforward. God keeps his word. So those young ones who are listening to me from home, um, if one asked you, have you ever read a book in the Bible? Yes, we have read the book of Joshua together in our church family. And what is it about? It is about God's faithfulness. What does it say? That God keeps his word because faithfulness is actually doing what you say. And how do we see God's faithfulness in the book of Joshua? Because long ago, God promised to give his people land, the land of Canaan, and in the book of Joshua, we see God fulfilling that promise. So you could say then, the book of Joshua is hashtag, a promise fulfilled. God has kept his word. God has honored his promises. He has done what he said he would do. Therefore, God is faithful. That's a, a basically really what we learn from the book of Joshua. I think it's been very exciting, and I know most of you would even be able to see how the story holds together. You would be able to remember Joshua chapter 1, the calling of Joshua after Moses, the servant of the Lord, is dead. God himself, at his own initiative, speaks to, the, uh, speaks to Joshua, telling him to be strong and courageous and to lead the people into the land that God had actually promised them. You, you, could, you could even follow the story how then from there uh, Joshua um, reminds the eastern tribes about their need to help their brothers to settle in the land and how they also pledge their commitment to follow. From there you remember how then Joshua sends out the spies to go and spy on the land, and particularly the city of Jericho. You will remember how these spies uh, end up in Rehab's house and how 
they also promised Rahab and her family that they would be rescued. You then remember the crossing of the Jordan, which was preached to us earlier on. You would then remember after they have crossed the Jordan how they put up a heap of stones as a memorial. You will then remember how then they then, after they have now crossed over, uh, they then have um, a circumcision ceremony that all the people who had been in the wilderness are now circumcised and are now prepared to really settle in the land of the promise. You will remember how then they celebrated the first Passover. It's like the first birthday of remembering the rescue from Egypt. You will then remember that it is after that that the commander of the Lord's army, a man who looks like an angel of the Lord, appeared before Joshua, bearing a sword in his hand. You know, and Joshua asking him in that epic moment, are you for us or against us? And him not answering either, but he say, I am the commander of the Lord's army. Now I have come. And then you can remember the tension that that left us with. What's now going to happen now that the commander of the Lord's army has come? Then from there, you will remember the fall of Jericho and the going round um, uh, once a day and seven times on the last day and the blowing of the trumpets and the walls coming tumbling down. You will then remember the defeat um, by I, a small, uh, smaller town or even village because of Achan's sin, a man who was called Achan. And you remember the judgment and the heaping of stones over Achan. But then soon after that, there was a fall of Ai. In your reading, you might also remember that some people called the Gibeonites came up to Joshua. They actually managed to deceive him. They deceived him that they were, not, they were from very, very far and that they need not to attack them. And so Joshua enters into a pact with them, into some understanding that they are going to remain on the land. After that, you would remember the big battles that were ahead. And from that moment, we see the sun standing still in this one particular battle. And from there, it's conquest after conquest. Uh, many kings um, overcome. And then that gets you to chapter 13, all the way to 21, where then there is the allotment, or the people getting their inheritance. We now see the promise is actually being realized. People are really getting the land that God had promised them. That takes us to chapter 22, where then the eastern tribes, the one we started with in chapter 1, now need to go back because their allotment was on the other side of the Jordan, on the eastern side of the Jordan. And now that they have finished settling their brothers, they are now ready to go back to their own land. And you remember just a few weeks ago, I was talking about how the people also decide, let's put up an altar of witness so that we'll always remember we also belong in the covenant family of God's people. Then after that, it gets us to chapter 23, which we are looking at today, which is indeed a farewell speech by Joshua, chapters 23 and 24. Really, is Joshua saying goodbye. It's a short story, but it is packed with a lot of drama uh, and action. A lot of things are really happening. It's an exciting book. It's also sad on certain instances. It raises big questions, some very big questions really, and maybe some of them have already come forward and we will try and answer them in the Q&A section afterwards. But it is telling us the story of a great God. It is telling us that God is faithful. So really, the story of the book of Joshua is primarily about a faithful God. Whatever else we might want to see and however exciting the epics might be, or the, the story with all its twists and turns, the big thing that we need to see is that this story is primarily about a faithful and gracious God who saves his people, who takes 
initiative to lead them into his promises. It's about a faithful God who delivers on his word. You know, it's about a faithful God who fights on behalf of his people, as we have heard from the reading in 23. It's about a faithful, gracious God who shows mercy even to sinners and outsiders like Rahab. And really, the book of Joshua is about God. And I know oftentimes it is easy, and you might even have heard other times, when the book is made to think that actually we should be thinking too much about Joshua, the man. Actually, the book doesn't give us so much about Joshua, the man. It doesn't tell us very much about the person of Joshua. He enters the scene and he leaves the scene at the end. But in between is a big story of a righteous, faithful, gracious, and indeed holy God. But you don't just get that one picture of God in the entire book. You actually also see his holiness. You know, the fact that he is good and gracious king, like we like to sing, doesn't mean that he's also not a holy God who demands faithfulness and obedience. You know, we do see within the book, God judges sin and unrighteousness when people do not hear what God says and do not obey to the latter these words of the law or the words that God has spoken, then they will face God's wrath and condemnation. Case in point would be Achan, who decided to enrich himself, or to indeed to take some of the things that were to be devoted to destruction, and he decided to hold on to some of them. And his judgment was severe. Indeed, he even caused the entire nation to turn their backs against their enemies, that is to run away from a small people group uh, or a small um, uh, city state called Ai. In other words, then, because the book is about the Lord himself and his faithfulness, then he alone is a holy God. He is to be obeyed to the letter, and indeed he deserves the glory for all the good things that he has done. But you would also perhaps have noticed that as we were working our way through the book, you'd have also seen the frailty or the weakness of people. Do you see that in yourself? Your own weaknesses. I guess we are very familiar with that. So for example, in the light of COVID-19, we are confronted with our own weakness as a human race. And even within this book, we also see human frailty. Because unless the Lord would fight for Israel, they had no chance of actually defeating the many nations that were up against them. They were never going to enter the land. I mean, there was a river in between them. They had been walking in the desert for 40 years. But unless there is a breakthrough from the Lord, there is no way they are going to enter the land. A swollen river was right there in front of them, many nations that indeed, according to some of the spies, in an earlier setting of the spies, notice these are huge giants. They live in huge fortified cities. What chance do we have of indeed conquering this land? They are weak and totally dependent on the Lord. But they're also weak in the sense that even though they see God's faithfulness to them, they still disobey. Akan's case would be an example. They are weak in the sense that even when they have seen God being very good and gracious to them, sin still is very close to them. And indeed they are overcome by sin. Even Joshua himself, in fact, he is deceived by the Gibeonites. He is also human. In fact, towards the end of the book, Joshua himself is going to die. So it's a book that also shows us human frailty, human weakness, you know, human inability. No wonder they even have these constant reminders. They keep on piling stones. On at least seven instances, they are piling up stones as reminders because they easily forget God's goodness and God's faithfulness. So it's a book that actually shows us human weakness, 
but in that sense then displays God's might and power. And so that's been the journey that we've been on. That as we see human weakness, we see God's might and power in acting on behalf of his people. Do you now get the story? It's an exciting story all the way from the beginning, showing us the faithfulness of God, showing us the holiness of God, showing us the gracious nature of God, but also showing us how weak human beings are and how much dependent upon the Lord human beings ought to be. Now in this chapter 23, which has been read to us, and indeed which makes a summary, we notice a number of things. And indeed this is what I'm going to close with. Let's only just read verses 1 to 5 one more time. A long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders and heads, its judges and officers, and said to them, I am now old and well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. For, behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes and those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you and will drive them out of your sight. And you shall possess their land, just as the Lord your God promised you. That is just verses 1 um, to five. So, three things that we need to remember. As we walk away from the book of Joshua and perhaps transition to Judges from next Sunday, three things to remember. The first thing is remember what God has done. Remember what God has done. And we find that in verses one to three. So Joshua now summons the Israel and all its leaders, and he says to them, verse 3, You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, for it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Remember what the Lord has done. So these are like the words of a dying man. Indeed, he says, verse 14, he is about to die. I am about to go the way of all the earth, which is an expression to mean I am about to die. So I want you to remember three things. One of them, remember what the Lord has done. And that's an important phrase throughout the Bible, to start with what the Lord has done. Because God in his grace, he always takes the initiative. He always goes first. And ours then is always a response. We never initiate anything, really. It is God who initiates it. It's interesting how even in the book of Joshua itself, how it opens, it is God's initiative to speak to his people by the power of his word and to say to Joshua, now go and take possession of the land. God always takes the initiative. So what are we then to remember? What are we to reflect on? What are we to bear in our minds constantly? What God has done. In this particular instance, God had fought on their behalf. God had led them for a long, long time. In fact, both in chapter 23 and in chapter 24, Joshua is looking back to show them God's faithfulness for many, many years. Looking back perhaps 40 years since they crossed the Red Sea, since they left Egypt, and how God has been faithful to them all the way through. And now how he has led them across the river Jordan and has actually given them the land for their possession. Remember what the Lord has done. And because that's an important point, can I just say, how then do we apply that today? If that's what Joshua and his people were to remember, what does that really mean for, for me and for you today? I think the instruction is the same for God's people in the new covenant. 
to remember what God has done. Now, the new Yeshua, who we have spoken about quite often throughout this book, is the Lord Jesus Christ. For indeed, this book itself pointed us to the new Yeshua, the new uh, Savior, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the believer is to remember over and over again what the Lord has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is why you often hear believers saying to one another, look to the cross. Remember what Jesus has done for you. Remember how he has acted on your behalf. For indeed we are told, it is the Lord who fought for you, verse 3. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Remember, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who indeed has fought for you, who has disarmed the powers and the principalities. He is the one who took the lonely path in Gethsemane to die on the cross for you and for me. So remember what the Lord has done. And that then, of course, elicits or causes in us to wear up gratitude, to wear up worship, to wear up with thanksgiving, to say, thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. It also puts you in a place of humility to remember that everything you have is a gift from God. It puts you in perspective when you hear, it is the Lord who fought for you. It is not you who did this on your own strength. So be grateful and worship the Lord. But in verse 4, we see something else that we need to remember. Remember um, what God has given you. Verse 4, Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes, those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. I think it is a reminder what God has already given. Now, in this particular instance, within the book of Joshua itself, what we are told here is that this land has been given to you. Remember what God has given. He has given you this land. He has fought for you, so be grateful for what he has done, but also remember the gift that he has given you, the land itself. And that's something important to remember. To remember that this was not yours in the first place. Other people and other nations were dwelling there. But now, the Lord has given it to you. To remember it is not by your own arm or by your own strength. The Lord has graciously given it to you. That's an important point to call to mind. The Lord has done it. The Lord has now given. What does that then mean for a New Testament believer living in Nairobi or anywhere else today? It is to appreciate or indeed to see the gift of God in the Lord Jesus Christ. What has he given us? I think we've been reminded quite a number of times is that we have been given a salvation. We have been rescued from sin. We have been given a new name. We have been adopted into the family of God. We now have a new status. And that's amazing. And it ought to strike us over and over again that we who are rebels, we who are far away, aliens and strangers, have now been brought near have been invited into the family home, have been sat at the table, have been given new clothes to wear. We have even been given a family ring to put on our fingers. We have been embraced. These are the gifts that we have received from the Lord. Then, you know, only by the merits of Christ, only by the goodness of Christ, have we received these things. Then what does that then mean? If we have been, indeed been given these things, we will see that in a short while in verse 6. 
It says, verse 6, Therefore, be very strong to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right nor to the left, that you may not indeed mix with these nations remaining among you, or make mention of their names or of their gods, or swear by them, or serve them, or bow down to them. But indeed, you shall cling to the Lord your God, just as you have done to this day. I think that then is a call. Because of what God has given, therefore, live like his people. Because of what he has already done for you, therefore, live like his covenant people. So, remember what God has done. Remember what he has given Live like his people. But there is one more and the last thing that we need to remember. Remember what God will do. In other words, remember his promises. It seems quite clear that even by this time, not all the land had been conquered by the time Joshua was exiting the scene. So in verse 5, it says, The Lord your God will push them back before you, and drive them out of your sight. And then you shall possess their land just as the Lord your God promised you. In other words, by the time Joshua is actually living, and indeed dying as we would see in chapter 24, not all the land had been uh, occupied. They hadn't thrown out all the enemies. So there was still more to be done. But what do people need to remember? The promises of God. What God will do. Now, you see, you have a basis of having confidence in the Lord because what he has done in the past, what he has already given to you in the present, but also what he will do in the future. I can't think of a better source of confidence in God's word than that. God has acted faithfully in the past. There is evidence of it now. You can therefore trust him for the future. He has a track record of faithfulness. You can see it. In fact, there are memorials scattered all over the land. Wherever we have been, there are stones piled up everywhere that remind us that God is faithful. Therefore, have confidence in him. Remember what God has promised to do, for indeed he will do it. And I think then, for the New Testament believer, you might wonder, how, how do I apply that truth? And I think it is to be reminded that indeed God's promises are yes and amen. And they have all indeed been, uh, been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. All those promises that we were given in the Old Testament, have found their fulfillment in the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Lord also promises many things for believers and for many people who would call on his name. So remember what God has committed to do. So for instance, God says that he will save us. He, was, he says, if we call on his name, we will be saved. And we need not to take those words casually. I know there are people who make light of the idea of calling on the name of the Lord and being saved. Some people might even think that actually praying for salvation does not save you. Well, it says quite clearly in Romans chapter 10, that if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead and you confess the same with your lips, then you will be saved. It doesn't get clearer than that, does it? God promises to save those who will call on his name. So remember what God has promised to do. And indeed, if you have called on the name of the Lord, you can have confidence that indeed he has saved you. And this is not false assurance based on my own words. It is based on the word of God. 
what he has said he will do. But he has said many other things. For example, he says to the believer that I will be with you. When he's commissioning the disciples, the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew 28 promises that he will always be with his people to the very end of the age. And that's very reassuring to know that Jesus is with us. Right now, Jesus is with us. In the face of coronavirus, in the uncertainty about life, Jesus is with us. In the face of a lot of doubt and shifting away from the gospel and a lot of opposition for the church, God's people can draw confidence in knowing that Jesus is right here with us. In the face of death of our loved ones, in the face of the frustration that comes when we know we perhaps might not see them again for a long time, our confidence can be built on knowing that even when we are mourning, when we are frustrated, Jesus is right there with us. I mean, to know that I will never leave you nor forsake you is a great promise. To read Romans chapter 8 and 31 and following and to know that nothing can separate us from the love that we have with, in Christ Jesus is very reassuring. To know that even death itself or pain or persecution will never separate us from the love of God that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Remember what the Lord will do. Even in the face of temptation, and when you are tempted to walk away from the faith, when you are feeling like you are weak and lowly, remember the Lord says He will bear you with His wings. Like we normally sing, He will hold you fast. He will not let you go. Those that are His are indeed His, and He won't let them go. For indeed, He is in them, and they are in Him. And that in Christness that we were hearing throughout the letter in Colossians is indeed such a firm promise. It is such a firm commitment by the Father Himself that can then be a strong foundation for our assurance in the gospel. How about to hear that he has prepared a place for us and that indeed he will come again. Isn't that amazing for the believer to know that Jesus will come again? Remember what God will do. This same Jesus, say the apostles in Acts chapter 1 and 2, whom you have seen go, did the angel announce to them, he will come again. This is not fantasy. This is not just something that Christians made up. This is not a pie in the sky somewhere. This is a sure foundation based on God's word. That indeed what he has said, he will do. And indeed, he will come again. Ahadi za Bwana hazivujiki milele. Yeye ni mwaminifu na lile amesema kwa kweli atatenda. So because of that, as you remember those three things, obey the Lord your God. It's a call to obedience as we read in 26. It's a call to cling to the Lord, to stay close to him, for indeed you are weak, but he is strong. But it's also a call to love the Lord your God, as we would read in verse 11 of chapter 23. This then calls us to want to love the Lord our God, to want to cling to the Lord our God, and to want to obey him with all our hearts. 
brothers and sisters. It's been amazing to read through Joshua together. And to see a picture of the faithfulness and the holiness and the gracious nature of our God. And as we have seen that image and that portrait, I hope this has not just been an academic look at the book. It's not just a box that we tick, oh, to mesoma Joshua Yota na to Mariza. But I pray that this is a call for us to remember what God has done in the past for his people. To see what then he has also done for the believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. To see what God gave to his old covenant people, Israel, in the book of Joshua. But also to see what he has given us in adopting us into his family through Jesus Christ. But it was to see what God would let alone do for his old covenant people of Israel and to reflect on what God has promised to do for us in his new covenant in the Lord Jesus Christ. May these call us to obey, to cling to him, and to love him with all our hearts. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for showing us Jesus through Joshua. Thank you for giving us a glimpse of how your people saw you at work in the wilderness and indeed in the crossing of the Jordan, settling into the land, seeing your grace in how you granted salvation and rescue for people who are far away like Rahab, seeing how you fought the battles for your people as indeed the mighty man of war who fights on behalf of his people. Lord, seeing how they dispossess the nations and how indeed, Lord, you give them strength for indeed you are the one who was working on their behalf. Please, Lord, grant that we will not be familiar with these words. So just think it's a story we've been reading. Grant that indeed these words may inspire us to remember that you are a holy God, to remember what you have done, to remember what you have given and indeed to remember what you will do. Father God, I pray for all who are listening to this, and for all of us, Lord, in this church family, that we would be those who respond with obedience. We would be those who respond with trust in your word. For indeed, your word can be trusted. For none of the good promises you made to your people Israel failed. Every one of them came to pass. So Lord, would you call us to trust? even in the face of difficulties, even in the face of challenges like the ones we are going through right now, even in the frustration of death itself, would you, Lord, help us to trust in your loving words, in your living words, in your true words? Would you help us to cling to you? Would you help us to love you with all our hearts? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.